Our team and parliament have confounded the critics. The critics just cannot quite bring themselves to write that ACT brought in nine rookie MPs and we have the best team in parliament. They said we wouldn't do it. They said we wouldn't do it, and when that prognostication didn't quite work, uh, they said that we'd be squeezed out under a new national leader. Instead, over the past three years, X remains New Zealand's fastest growing political movement, and it's not even close. It's true, though, and it's thanks to the individuals who make up our team. So before I go any further, let me say thank you to my parliamentary colleagues who give their all for a better New Zealand every day. Act finish. Thank you. Act finish 2022 with great momentum. You know, some people say that nice guys finish last, but they forgot to mention arrogant pricks. And, <laughs> The simple truth is that every month, ACT becomes bigger than one person, and ultimately, it's about you. You know, Brooke was rated the best first-term MP by Parliament's most senior journalist. Nicole was ranked sixth, Karen won plaudits too, and Mark Cameron was not ranked, but actually, I think he was robbed. He may be the hardest working of all, but it's a funny thing about cowsheds. You don't see many Wellington journalists looking for politicians and cowsheds up and down the country. Too much of Mark's hard work goes unreported. I could go on, but we have a great team that trusts each other and a team that you can trust. And now we start a new year with a target for our real momentum, October 14. I want to thank our hosts at the Maritime Museum, and as Brooke has said, apologise and thank our original hosts at Five Knots our second uh, venue at Odake Bay uh, that was hit by flooding, uh, and especially apologise to those people who still went to Odake Bay. Uh, and finally, thank the wonderful people here at the Maritime Museum for hosting us, nearly three times larger than the venue that we first set out for, and we still had a waiting list for this event. That's got to be a sign that acts on a roll. And again, thank you, because it's because of you. Thank you for giving up your time and your money to support ACT's first event of this election year. And it's important because our mission is to deliver real change. It's not going to be good enough to simply paint a red government blue and pretend it's all fixed by endlessly promising to just get things done. Trimming the sail will not work. We need to chart a whole new course. See, we wrote this speech before we knew it was at the Maritime Museum, but the, the, meta <laughs> the metaphors are working quite well. And we can do it with a brand new coalition of like-minded New Zealanders that we in this rep room represent. First of all, this government needs to change. And I know there'll be sceptical people who say, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? But it's not just me. The latest Curia poll has New Zealanders saying the country is going in the wrong direction by 53 to 33. The latest NZIER business confidence survey shows business confidence at the lowest level since records began in 1970. I mean, that's all of Brooks' lifetime, twice. 73% of firms expect conditions to deteriorate. Kiwis are smart and they're just voting with their feet. They've seen Fed farmers today come out with the lowest ever confidence among farmers. And the way that farmers have been beaten on by the Labour Party and the Green Party's regulatory bludgeon over the years, I'm not surprised. The net result, perhaps the most important long-term poll for New Zealand, is that last year 42,800 New Zealand citizens emigrated Remember when John Key stood in the cake tin and said, enough people to fill this stadium have left? Well, we're back there again. And it also explains why there's a worker shortage. And so it falls back to us to give them back a country that they feel proud to return to once more. And it's not difficult to see where the gloom comes from. You only have to look at the government. They just don't get it. 
And it's not just that they're screwing up one or two bad policies. It's the values that run through everything they do which have caused us to veer so badly off track. Now, Labor's list of failures, I've got to say, would be quite funny if only they'd happened to another country, especially Australia. Uh, but unfortunately, the Labor Party is governing New Zealand. And let me run through some of their shooting of their own feet. Um, they tax tradies' utes to help wealthy people buy Teslas. And here's the thing with that. It's not only totally opposite to the values of a Labour Party, but it actually doesn't change New Zealand's emissions one bit, because those emissions are already capped by the emissions trading scheme. If one person buys a Tesla and frees up credits, all that does is allow someone else to emit the same amount. So none of that taxing tradies to let the wealthy buy Teslas is making any net difference to the climate whatsoever. And then they want to tax the most carbon efficient farmers in the world broke and watch their former customers around the world eat far food from farmers who emit more carbon dioxide. Now only Labour could damage the economy and the environment with the same policy. And just for the avoidance of doubt, and I know that there will be people here who have been badly affected by flooding in the last few weeks, taxing Kiwi cows for their farts and burps will not make one iota of difference to flooding in Auckland. Clearing drains regularly, that would help. And it's insulting and infantile to pretend otherwise as 800 words of wasted column inches in the Herald by James Shaw tried to tell us just the other day. And then this government goes on on climate. They banned oil and gas exploration to reduce carbon emissions. Now exploration will take place overseas and New Zealand firms will import coal, about 5 million tonnes a year at the moment, from Indonesia to make up for the lack of oil and gas. So yes, we can bankrupt ourselves in the pursuit of some nebulous goal, but it doesn't mean we should. What about housing? They loudly promised they would build 100,000 houses. But it all comes down to problem definition. The problem was not a shortage of houses. It was more specific than that. It was a shortage of serviced sections to build them on. So Kiwi Build became a joke. You know, out of fair play, I almost feel that it's mean to bring up Kiwi Build these days. But it became a joke. Once they figured out that problem, they started wholesale government developments, the whole lot. And now Kainga Ora is trying to make housing affordable by using taxpayers' money to build up the price of land materials and builders, even higher. I mean, this stuff is so obvious, so stupid, and so pervasive through their policy responses. They say that there's not enough competition in the grocery market. I think that's probably true. And I actually just add, it's not just supermarkets, but also politics where duopolies can lead to poor results for consumers. So what is Labor's solution? Well, they want to force supermarkets to sell to their competitors at government-controlled prices. But I don't know if anyone here has been in the fast-moving consumer goods business, but pricing thousands of goods every day is not only unworkable, it will discourage foreign competitors from entering the New Zealand market. What should be the right price for, for fast-moving consumer goods, the things you find on supermarket shelves? How should they have been priced during the crisis of a flood? Who knows? Certainly not the Commerce Commission. And if you doubt that this policy is completely unworkable and will repel competitors from entering the market, well, they actually had to promise Costco that they would be exempt from the policy so that they would come here. They then got worried about loan sharks exploiting vulnerable lenders. So they then decided to make everyone in New Zealand report how much cat food they bought before they could get a mortgage or a credit card. <laughs> you, know, you think, I mean, if only this was being made up. Um, some people say that I would be good as a stand-up comedian, but all I'm doing is describing the Labour Party's policy agenda. <laughs> And, and people laugh. The only reason people laugh is that if they didn't, they'd cry. 
uh, and sometimes there are more serious consequences. They said they wanted to protect Māori children, so they changed the Oranga Tamariki Act. Those kids then got taken out of safe homes and put back into objectively more dangerous ones because they think if you've got to honour the treaty, then whānau is always best. And it takes the courage of someone like Karen Chua to stand up and show them just how wrong they are. Then they wanted to improve the quality of fresh water. But they, this is quite a good one. They accidentally defined a wetland so broadly that a paddock with a man-made pipe drain flowing into it could technically be defined as a wetland. 102 houses are held up in the Waikato while lawyers argue whether or not that paddock really is a wetland under Labour's fresh water laws. Each one of them, of course, charging by the hour and making sure that the next generation finds housing less affordable. Another serious one, they wanted to solve the problem of shootings. So they banned 240,000 firearms only to retrieve 60,000. Now you needn't be a mathematician to work out there's 180,000 unaccounted for firearms out there, the ones the government deemed were the most dangerous. And you don't need to be a criminologist to have a few clues that the gangs now have the rest. Then they thought, let's improve the quality of journalism. So they decided, I know what we'll do. $55 million, the Public Interest Journalism Fund, will pay media organisations, but only if they report consistent with our view of the treaty. Now, only Labour could spend $55 million, taxpayer money, trying to improve journalism, but actually widely damaging public trust in journalism. We just can't afford to keep doing this. Then they said, and this was Jacinda Ardern's special promise, they wanted to lift children out of poverty. And the only way they've done that is by raising benefits. But the laws of economics are still in place. There are now 30,000 more kids living in a benefit-dependent household than there were when they started trying to cure child poverty. And all the evidence shows that growing up without parents going to work is bad for kids' development and the negative effects last for generations. This insincere peddling, the incoherent and incompetent, that is the Labour government under which we've lived for the last five years. And it falls to us to reverse, not refine this lunacy. No ifs, no buts, and no more excuses. Jacinda Ardern's idealism simply collided hard with reality, and all New Zealanders are now paying the price. But every... Thank you. But, you know, every time I hear Chris Luxon say that Labour doesn't get things done, it makes me a little nervous. Could he seriously want them to do more? I mean, just, I mean, sure. I think about Jacinda Ardern seriously telling New Zealanders that yes, you could go and sit in your friend's garden, but no, I don't trust you to go inside and use the toilet. I mean, this happened in New Zealand within the last two years. It's difficult, really, to believe now. But this is what we went through. I actually think, rather than a government that gets things done, she did quite enough. We don't need a government that gets more done. We need a government that does a lot less so you can get things done. And, you know, and our new Prime Minister, and I throughout this speech will do my best to differentiate between the Chris's, but it, it may not be easy. Um, our new Prime Minister, his only policy is to dump his own party's unpopular policies. And, and that leaves a lot of questions. For example, will the union and Māori caucus factions within the Labour Party actually let him dump their prize projects? Does he really want to dump them? Or does he really think that we're all just a bit slow and we'll understand them better if he just explains them? As he's suggested, we don't understand co-government, but if it was called mahitahi, then everything would be fixed. <laughs> now, I know that stands for one work, and it's really not obvious how that is going to bring any better understanding than the confusion they admit they've caused already. 
But here's a thought experiment. Let's say, just for a moment, we take them at their word, and they really are going to dump all of their unpopular policies. Let's say Hipkins unwinds three waters, dumps the media merger, cancels the so-called fair pay agreements that aren't fair and aren't really agreements either, ends the co-governance culture war and puts the skids under the jobs tax they're trying to call income insurance, and let's say commits to the conception of the treaty that treats New Zealanders as adults with equal political rights, then he puts victims at the centre of crime policy instead of trying to empty the prisons as Labor's primary goal in law and order so far as anyone can tell. Next, they'd have to end their war on immigration, start treating New Zealand like it's a country built on it. Uh, because, you know, starving businesses of workers doesn't magically make them more productive, which is basically their strategy. What it does do is it hands another advantage to global competitors for New Zealand firms and makes it less attractive to stay and work here for Kiwis as well. It could then stop using education as a political staging tool to recruit children to ideological causes. Now this is all sounding a bit hopeful, but let's just do this thought experiment. Let's say he dumps all that and it's not even a complete list. What happens next? Well, Labor would be back to where they started in 2017 with big promises big problems and no solutions. And the truth is, I don't think they'll do it. It's not as though Hipkins has been quietly seething in the background of the Ardern government opposing everything it does. In fact, he's a founding member of Ardern's kitchen cabinet, right up to the orchestrated handover of power last month, something which I do have to give them credit for. If only they were as good at organising health and education as they are uh, at handling a transfer of power, we'd be in a great space. But there's a much more likely scenario than Labor actually dumping their own policies. A much more likely scenario is that another Prime Minister, Chris, has that opportunity to dump Labor's destructive policies in just 249 days' time. The countdown's on. But even then, let's be absolutely clear. A reversal of Labor policies under a national government is far from guaranteed. And if you doubt that, let history be your guide. Five times National has vigorously opposed Labor's policy from opposition, and five times they've followed Labor into government and bedded in all of the policies they said they would remove. That is part of the reason, in fact it's most of the reason, that New Zealand is where it is today. The opposition have been there to help the government keep its policies in place. It's because National governments don't actually oppose Labor policies. They just want to manage them. And something strange happens to them when they get into the back of a ministerial limo. Suddenly, those Labor policies feel just a little bit friendlier once it's you who's in charge on a leather seat. And it's only with a decent contingent of ACT MPs that will make sure those reversals actually happen. I think that's why ACT is here. I think that's why our movement is thriving. Our job is to make sure that promises are kept. Our job is to make sure that we don't just get a change of government, but a government of change as well. Thank you. Right, we're back. Second half. Um, voting for more of the same, and that's what is on the table, these are the choices, uh, funnily enough will get us more of the same. You know, it's not just about evicting Labour from the beehive, it's about evicting their ideas as well. Getting rid of Labour's bad ideas is just clearing the decks for the real job we have to do. And under either, Chris, there's still the same problem. From where do those new ideas come from? Just stopping Labour lunacy doesn't solve the long-term problems left by successive governments. We need more than a choice between getting things done or bread and butter. How did politics get so inane in this country? New Zealand needs more than a new slogan. It needs a real change of policy taking the country in the better direction that it deserves. And in the end, it comes down to a simple question. Who do you trust? But before that, there's a question of values. The central cause of this country's troubles is that successive governments have abandoned the values of progress. 
You know, once upon a time, rulers placed little or no value in a person. I know some people will say that was 2021. But I'm talking further back than that. I'm talking about a time hundreds of years ago, but in the wider history not that long, where people were simply fodder for the doctrine of the church or the king who got their powers from God. And at best, if they, and it was best for the rulers if those people couldn't read too much, didn't ask too many questions. Putin still believes that, something like it. So does the government of Iran, especially if you're female. But the Enlightenment changed all that. Descartes said, je pense alors je suis. See, I've been learning lots of languages lately. Um, <laughs> But he said, je pense à je suis. If you think, then you are. It's that simple. We all matter because we're all capable of thinking for ourselves. And I think the importance of that has been forgotten. We don't say it enough, but it's the foundation of our society. And after that, many amazing things happened. Galileo looked through his telescope he saw Jupiter's moons and revolutionized navigation among many other parts of science. The church at the time, they could threaten him with torture all they liked. They might have thought he was an arrogant prick. I'd love to be in the same league as Galileo. But their word of God collided with reality, actually a bit like someone else I know. There was a book once, 100 Authors Against Einstein, and it was a book about denouncing the great man's theories. And he was asked, what are you going to say about that? And he said, well, why a hundred authors? If I were wrong, one of them would have been enough to prove me wrong. He used reason. But the Enlightenment wasn't just about reason. It was about universal human rights. No matter where you came from, no matter your race, your religion or gender. Martin Luther King Jr. was quoting Enlightenment thinkers when he said, the architects of our republic were signing a promissory note that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable, unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Or, as the current president, Joe Biden, recently put it so eloquently, all men and women were created equal by, er, you, you know, the thing. Uh, uh, and I just... I just, I just make the point that progress is not always linear, but we're basically going in the right direction. <laughs> Our own Treaty of Waitangi was also written in the shadow of the Enlightenment. It said the government had kawanatanga, the right to govern. The people had tino rangatiratanga, or self-determination over their lives and their property. It also said they had natikanga katoa rite tahi, the same rights and duties as each other. So what was it about? Limited government, self-determination, property rights, and equality. I reckon the chiefs who signed the treaty then would be here at this X lunch supporting our ideas and values today. And, you know, it's difficult to overstate what Enlightenment thinking has meant. It's not only freed people around the globe from violence, hunger, and oppression. It's freed people to live twice as long. How often do we hear about, let alone celebrate, the values of reason and universal humanity in this country? You know, the values that have given the average person a whole extra life. Actually, we hear the exact opposite from our government. What matters is not the content of your character. What matters most is your background and your ancestry. They think we are not all thinking and valuing beings. We are not all equal. We do not have the same rights and duties. We're either oppressors or oppressed, victims or villains. We should simply feel shame for our heritage rather than learn from it. And you'll be able to think of examples themselves. But tell me. Is this really progress? You know, there's no point thinking and evaluating if you can't share your thoughts. But Labour tells us that free speech is dangerous. Mind you, on the weekend they were telling us that um, caffeinated, caffeinated drinks are dangerous. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of dangers in a Labour world. But free speech is one they're particularly concerned about. 
and it comes with a culture of feeling we know best. Well, ACT is built on the principle that censorship ain't the answer. The best antidote to bad ideas isn't to just shout them down, cancel, deplatform, and nullify people for thinking the wrong way. It's to debate and defeat them with better ideas. But in health, in education, and resource management, we are told that what Māori thought during 400 years that Māori spent in isolation from the world is more important than our bonds of common humanity. And if you question this doctrine, then you're racist, obviously. Well, Nicole, Karen, and myself, and thousands of others will take the name-calling and the trolling because in the end, we believe this country can do so much better. And to that... Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. But unfortunately, today, we live under new doctrines that, that look like life pre-enlightenment. It's more important to follow the new beliefs from the high priests of privacy, health and safety, and the principles of the treaty than it is to apply your own judgment and take responsibility for a situation. Labor has this regulatory juggernaut that disempowers honest Kiwis every day while hoarding power with those who don't deserve it and have no idea how to use it. You only have to look at the insane triple CFA, the pipe in the paddock come wetland, the trouble with getting a wharf consented, even if you are a port. Forget setting up a new supermarket if the Overseas Investment Act and the Resource Management Act weren't enough to kill off any possible ambitions you might have had. You wouldn't believe it. There is now a grocery commissioner. The Commerce Commission has a bespoke regulator devoted to harassing just one sector. Life is expensive in New Zealand because red tape saps progress. The new priests make sensible people run the hamster wheel of compliance activity, but it's unkiwi. This country should be a project in human progress. Of course, the COVID response, and I know everyone's trying to move on from that, but it did show us peak doctrine from the high priests of the podium. ACT made the simple suggestion that people who don't want to take the vaccine could do a rapid antigen test twice a week to show others they are not a risk. Unfortunately, not only had the government banned rapid antigen tests, we were attacked by Judith Collins, no less. We will all be counting the cost of the toxic groupthink that was engaged in by much of the New Zealand political system towards the end of 2021 for years to come. I'm proud of the role ACT played, speaking truth to power and proposing better ways for people to get on at a time when so many people were being beaten and bludgeoned down in fear. Nowhere, though, is the retreat from progress more obvious than in the field of education. You know, there's no more precious gift than a useful education. There's no surer cure for poverty than the empowerment and education of the next generation. You know, we need to make sure that any kid born into this country, whether they're rich or poor, town or country, boy or girl, gets a chance, a chance to be the best in the world if they imply themselves. It's that place in their community where a knowledgeable adult they respect exposes them to the wonders of human knowledge, a place where they can be initiated into wider humanity, where what they think matters less than whether they think. But today, education is at the back of the bus, unless you're interested in indoctrination. Perhaps the most soul-destroying thing about this Labour government is their abandonment to the commitment to education and opportunity. Every time there's a crisis, the first thing they cut, the first thing they sacrifice, and sometimes the only thing they sacrifice, is education. We saw it last week. All Auckland region schools had to close with 12 hours official notice, even in rural communities unaffected by flooding. Why can't that school community use reason to make its own decision? If there's a better group to make decisions on students than their own mums and dads and teachers, well, this government hasn't told us who it is. But it comes down to that simple question, who do you trust? For me, it's very simple. I trust the principal, I trust the board, I trust the school communities, I don't trust the Ministry of Education. 
they're the ones who have screwed it up time and time again, putting education to the back of the bus. And it will do more damage to the long-term future of this country than anything else that is currently going on. And I think... And I think it's worth asking why kids don't go to school. I mean, it doesn't help that the government regularly tells them not to go to school, sometimes for the craziest reasons. It's that there's less to learn when they get there. You know, they're not stupid. They know that sitting on beanbags in a quote-unquote modern learning environment rolled out by Hekia Parata, let's remember, and then on those beanbags attempting to recreate 5,000 years of human knowledge for themselves, they know that's dumb. The new curriculum refresh, which attempts to put 400 years of human history when Maori lived in isolation on a par with the rest of human history will make things much worse. It's time to recall our enlightenment values. It's time to commit to a country based on progress. It's time to champion a country where each and every person is not fodder for the new doctrines of the woke left, but a thinking and valuing being with the same rights and duties as every other thinking and valuing being in this country. Now, I, uh, thank you. Thank you. now I've argued before that New Zealand has a cycle. Upheaval, milk and honey, dissension, and upheaval again. And I've argued that today we stand at another precipice. It's too hard to build a house, a business, a wharf, a road, a working stormwater system, or much else. It leaves a generation wondering what future this country offers them. The education system is not fit for purpose. Most treaties, by definition, are devices to bring people together, and ours is used to divide us by race. If we want to keep the dream of a first world nation and an island paradise alive, it falls on us to take on the job ourselves. In another decade, I can guarantee you, our country will be changed significantly. We are entering a period of upheaval. The direction that we choose is what we'll decide. And the question is, what do we want New Zealand to look like in 10 or 15 years' time? That's why we're here. Well, let me tell you about ACT. ACT wants to leave this country a better place for the children and those who come after them. And let me finish by painting a picture of what our future could look like if we make the right choices, if we choose real change this year and in the years to come. Imagine we've had a national conversation about the Treaty of Waitangi and New Zealanders have decided that Article 3 is correct when it says all citizens have na tikanga katoa rite tahi, or the same rights and duties. Co-government, dividing New Zealand into tangata whenua land people and tangata tiriti treaty people is no longer. Instead, we've moved on to meet our challenges as a modern, multi-ethnic liberal democracy, more united than ever. That is ACT's referendum on co-governance. Imagine we have a tax system where people aren't punished with five different increasingly higher tax rates as they succeed and earn more income. We have a political culture where people don't look first to the beehive bureaucrats as the answer to all our problems. Instead, they look to local communities, whether it's getting stuff built or deciding when schools should open. That is X policy of localism. And it's regional partnerships with government for infrastructure that's been returned to councils with three waters having been consigned to the dustbin of history. It's local democracy for fresh water laws and tertiary institutions that succeed or fail on their value to students, not whether they play the internal politics of te pukenga, which is what's being proposed for our politics sector right now. Imagine that before politicians make new laws, they were forced to ask, what's the problem the government is trying to solve here? What are the alternative solutions? What might the unintended consequences of this law be? What will the costs and benefits of the law be, and who will pay the costs and receive the benefits? Imagine truly rational, common-sense regulation that isn't creating yet more complexity and cost. 
That is Act's Regulatory Standards Act, independent select committees, and wholesale change in thinking about the role of government as making rules to lord it over people's lives. It means it's possible to build enough homes for the people who want to live here. There are no children living in motels. Millennials are homeowners, and so are Gen Y. Both are now committed to New Zealand because New Zealand has said you can actually afford your own part of a property-owning democracy. You're included here, and it's worth staying. That is X property rights-based approach to resource management, sharing GST with councils that let building go ahead, as Brooke has put up for debate in Parliament recently. And that is private quality assurance, building to break, building to break innovators free from council control. This is a country, imagine. Imagine that welcomes ideas, capital, and people who want to contribute to the rich fabric of that first world country in an island paradise. That is X policy of exempting democratic OECD countries from the strangling red tape of the Overseas Investment Act. People want to send money here. I think we should actually let them. After decades near the bottom of the OECD rankings, imagine productivity is growing again, allowing businesses to increase wages genuinely, not because the government made another rule, and allowing consumers to make smarter choices, including climate-friendly ones, instead of being battered by pointless, punitive new taxes. And that means that pharmaceuticals, new life-saving and life-extending drugs, are no longer something that other countries have. That is X policy of dumping the bureaucratic Zero Carbon Act and capping the emissions trading scheme, not at some fanciful, quixotic target, but at the same level as our trading partners that we compete with are actually achieving. We then return the revenue for that, from that emissions trading scheme to families so they can make smarter climate choices. And imagine we allow education entrepreneurs. Just think about that for a moment. Entrepreneurship in education. Imagine allowing education entrepreneurs to offer parents and students real choice, real power and control over their kids' learning and their future. Instead of having to send their kid to the local state school, whether they like it or not, parents have more and better choices. Attendance is high because schools transfer valuable academic knowledge, and kids know it, so they actually want to go to school and learn. And imagine them learning we're proud of our history, even as we learn from it because Kiwis know we're capable of holding more than one thought at a time in our minds. That is X policy of student education accounts, putting parents in charge of their kids' share of education funding, empowering them to purchase the education their kids require off an open market. And imagine having a justice system that respects victims instead of making excuses for violent offenders. It's not only safe to run a dairy, which should be one of New Zealand's biggest goals right now, sadly, but men and women can walk around our larger cities after dark without keeping someone on the phone while they walk to their car, eyes over their shoulder looking out for trouble. Imagine that. Very bad for Uber, but good for everyone else. That is X truly victim-centric approach to crime and punishment. In short, Imagine a first-rate, first-world country that could, be, that could be our future if we choose real change this year. And no, it will not be easy. We face complex problems that have not yielded to the glib student politics solutions proposed by Labour. And even if National can manage Labour's policies better, New Zealand deserves even better than that. I believe in better, and I don't know about you, but I think this country is worth working for. It's more than a little experiment. This country is our home. It is the place that is worth building on for the next generation. The question, thank you. The question is what can people in this room do to make it happen? Well, under our system, politicians govern for two years out of three, but this year, we can make them pay attention. If you share X values, 
If you're someone who finds yourself here in the most remote, most beautiful country on earth because you or your ancestors wanted a better tomorrow for their offspring, if you're someone who believes in the values of progress, the power of reason, and the equal right of every human being, if you believe that in spite of their flaws, free markets and the free exchange of ideas and inspiration are our last best hope to eliminate poverty, raise living standards and improve the climate, then there is a new movement for you. If you don't want to see more of the same, if you're not convinced that national and labor are really different after the last 90 years of political duopoly, if you believe in the power of policy underpinned by good values to make this country a better place, if some of all of this sounds like you, then I'm asking you not to just agree, but to act. This country is one that does things for itself, and if we don't trust ourselves with the job in hand, it'll simply get left to the same old crowd. So what can you do to help? Well, if you want to help, number one, we'd love you to give your party vote to act. Every party vote for ACT gets us closer to electing another independent-minded MP. That means the government's more likely to change, and the change is more likely to be real. Number two, we'd love you to influence others. Word of mouth remains the most powerful tool of political persuasion. In your life, there are hundreds of people who don't know me or us, but they do know you. And you telling people why you're giving your party vote to act is the most powerful form of advertising there is. We can't even buy that. But number three, get involved. Decisions in democracy get made by those who show up. We're fortunate to live in a country where politics is voluntary. Every three years, people assemble for a peaceful contest of ideas. It's perhaps the best thing we have going for us as a country, but people who offered to host a house meeting, to introduce our candidates to their friends, or just come together to talk things over, over a beer or three. That's a bit naughty, I don't know if you're allowed that now. A beer or two, or I get in trouble. This is the lifeblood of our democracy, and it's time we had a transfusion of freedom. You know, people who go out and put a sign on their fence to signal their support to their neighbors and passing traffic, that makes a difference, and you can do it. You can tell our good people at the desk here that you'd like to do that, and they'll, they'll add that to your file, so we'll bring a sign around sometime. You know? And then those people, like John Windsor, one of our greatest volunteers is here, you know, they reach into their pocket, and they pull out a direct mail letter they're helping to, to, to deliver to their neighbor. Then they share their, our content on social media, putting their personal endorsement on X message amongst their network. These are all pretty easy things you can do that make a difference. And they donate their money in return for nothing more than the warm feeling that more people will hear X message from a well-funded campaign. This all takes courage. It takes effort. But we can't simply wait for the pendulum to swing back. And together we can reverse Labor's damage and chart a new course for this country, one that matches the aspiration that our ancestors had for us and that shows the spirit of doing it for ourselves lives on. We can do more than just stop the damage. We can deliver the real change that will make this country, again, the best on earth. I'm up for it. X team is up for it. If you're up for it, then join us. And together, on October 14, let us all in this room be part of making history. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.